example of the importance of evaporative cooling and use of uh, um, high quality water and giving them the water bottles on the <laughs> um, So uh, today's panel, as you, as you can all read, is, uh, is entitled, If You Can't Measure It, You Can't Improve It, uh, Software Improvements for Power Energy Measurement Capabilities uh, at HPC. This is really a continuation of some discussions of panels that have been taking place at SC uh, for the last several years. Uh, as we move from, uh, we look back historically, a high PUE and a, oh my goodness, what do we actually do to understand energy efficiency in HPC data centers, uh, in part tracking what was happening in industry, but also thinking about the, the similar but differential challenges that exist uh, in the HPC world. And so as we have increasingly detailed instrumentation, part of the question is how do we strike this balance between optimizing for performance and optimizing for energy efficiency and how we trade those things off. And so we have a panel today to talk about those. Here's how I'm hoping this will go. We'll do, uh, we'll do brief presentations from each of the panelists and then we'll throw the floor open for conversation. And I hope that will be a lively uh, debate and conversation. And when you do have questions, please come up to the microphone. Uh, and just so you know, we are recording uh, this, uh, so uh, do, uh, do think about that as, as you speak. Uh, not that I'm too worried about that, but just be aware of it. So I was thinking about this uh, and the fact that we have serial number one of the Cray-1 sitting out uh, in the 30-year history. Uh, that was a fairly energy-hungry beast by the day. Uh, but pales in comparison to the machines we're deploying today. Of course, this is Oak Ridge's summit there uh, on, on the right-hand side of the slide. So different set of issues uh, that come with scale. I think that's one of the lessons is that quantitative change really brings some qualitative change in how we think about things. Because in the early days of supercomputing, energy costs, eh, they really weren't something you gave much thought about. And cooling, uh, while well, I suspect I, like many of you, remember when uh, machine rooms were cooled for polar bear habitation. Uh, and that was pretty much the norm. Uh, and so a lot of energy lost, but in the grand scheme of things, not something that we worry too much about. Clearly, uh, we do now. Uh, so how we think about uh, uh, keeping the future cool uh, and energy efficient, uh, we have uh, four panelists. Uh, and, and you could read the program as well as I can. And they'll offer their perspective from the Swiss perspective, uh, the nurse perspective, the Rika perspective in Japan, uh, and the Lawrence Livermore perspective again in the US. I do want to pose just a few questions for you to think about uh, as you frame your, your, your own questions before I turn the floor over to Jack. Um, and here are just a few to begin with. How is the instrumentation at your site or the ones that you use and of your applications altered the way they run or the environment in which they run? In other words, how much uh, offline and online introspection is there really? Uh, and what measurements uh, and instrumentation have had the most impact? Because we know that application tuning and energy efficiency is sometimes at odds in how you think about tuning the parameters. And then finally, what capabilities, if any, do you think would make the world better uh, in terms of what you would do? Uh, and then a few other, just to frame that, what are the advantages of these tools, uh, not just at leading edge sites, but at smaller sites? It's not just about uh, the top 20 or the top 500, but if you're a campus uh, site, how might you use those in a great way? Uh, what are the software sustainability challenges in terms of incorporating these things and tuning them as technologies change? Uh, what aspects of software design and development uh, would help application teams uh, tune codes for power usage? And finally, um, should this be part of the regular development cycle? Um, you know, how much time and energy, no pun intended, do you invest uh, in doing this as part of normal code development? Uh, recognizing that there's sometimes some conflicting objectives as part of that. And then I'll leave you with this last thought to think about. Um, and there's an old saying that the electric light bulb did not appear from continuous candle improvement, that sometimes there are disruptive innovations. Uh, and what is that balance of continuous innovation versus disruptive innovation as we think about energy efficiency uh, at ever larger scales? Uh, and with that, I'll turn the floor over to Jack. So 
I am Jack Deslip. I lead the Application Performance Group at NERSC. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of different activities that NERSC has going on that I think are related uh, to the theme of this panel. Um, and you know, I personally <coughs> represent more the application side of the thing, uh, of, the, of the table, more than the, the facility side. But I'm going to try to cover a little bit of both. So I think one of the exciting things that NERSC as a facility has been up to, and this is largely due to the folks that I have pictured up here on this slide, um, who are part of the kind of operations group at the, at the facility, is uh, putting together a new, an, a new framework that they call Data Collect that, that collects um, facility and job and um, uh, uh, data from the, from the systems themselves and, and sort of aggregates that all into uh, kind of a single location where that data can kind of begin to be correlated together and visualized and analyzed in a, in, a, in a way where we can gain new insights that we might not have been able to gain before. So some of the data that they're collecting is the power data from panels, PDUs, the UPSs. They're, they're collecting temperature and humidity data, building management data, uh, things like indoor particle counters, weather stations, and Recently, they began collecting now syslog data from the systems themselves, job data, the file system, luster, GPFS statistics, performance and networking data for things like the Aries counters in the, in the craze. Um, and they put together a really nice infrastructure to gather this and organize it. The messages themselves are brokered by RabbitMQ at a rate of, I guess, 20,000 items per second. We're now looking at, I think, over 100 terabytes of data in the system. and uh, can all be visualized through this Kibana, Grafana uh, infrastructure and, and you can begin to do some, some powerful queries to, to understand and correlate the data from the different sources. Um, so one example of how this was used was the decision by the facility to turn on dynamic band speed control for Cori. Uh, and I think we were the first Cray site to do this, um, maybe the first XC. Um, so uh, this, this happened in April this year, and you can see uh, in these charts, I guess the axes are pretty, a little bit hard to read, but what you're seeing here is in this first plot here, the temperature, I guess you can't see the, the mouse, but the, the, the upper left plot is the temperature in, in Cori. Um, this is the fan speed in, in the lower left, um, where you can see it, it, up until April 6th, it was essentially just pin to a, a particular value and then we start, uh, we turn on the dynamic fan speed and you can see the, in the bottom right the actual kilowatts being consumed by the, by the fan. And so turning it on obviously allows us to save kilowatts and you can see that when we are able to do that confidently because we can correlate that with the actual processor temperature which is this upper right plot in, in, in the graph. Um, so the the other part I want to talk about and try to correlate these two stories together is the application readiness activity, and that's the part that I've been leading. Um, and one of the points I want to make is that in some sense, users are having to think about energy efficiency just by default. And that's because uh, we, we're making a change as a center and I think as a community towards energy efficient architecture, <coughs> and that is forcing them to make changes to their applications. Um, and so I think you know, you can think about that as, by default, the decisions we're making are forcing our users to think about energy efficiency. And so driven by power consumption, anticipation, we're making, uh, we, we made a move in the acquisition of Cori towards uh, an energy efficient processor with lightweight cores and nice lining. Um, and uh, the Cori system, which is this 30 petaflop system, has really been a boon for science in, in the, the DOE Office of Science. But the many core architecture has really required code modernization in an effort to use those processors efficiently. Um, and this has been uh, sort of a challenge to our users. Uh, in particular, energy efficient processors like the KNL have multiple uh, kind of new novel hardware features that, can op that you need to optimize against and that may limit performance and may limit the energy efficiency in applications. There's the fact that now these have many um, I guess any energy efficient uh, processors in general could have heterogeneous cores. Um, 
the, they're typically, at least on Cori, they're running the, the core, they're running at a lower clock speed than traditional sort of Xeon processors. They have bigger vectors, they have new instruction sets, they have multiple memory tiers. And it's pretty easy for our user community, particularly one as big as Nurse, with 7,000 users, 700 different applications, to kind of get bogged down in the weeds. And you know, I think the natural questions that come up are, how do, you, how do they know what Kano hardware feature to target, or what's limiting their performance or their energy efficiency? How do they know, and, and maybe most important to them, is how do they know when to stop? How do they know when their, their code is performing well in an absolute sense? Um, and so what we've done at, at NERSC is to um, work with a targeted set of codes. We work with about 20 codes as part of the NERSC Exascale Science Application Program. And one way that we frame this conversation about uh, improving efficiency is by utilizing the roof line model. And what we, what, what, the way that we view the roof line model is a way to visualize the data that we've begun to collect from applications using tools like uh, IPM, Liquid, and PAPI to record and understand um, uh, the, the performance counters that we're able to collect in hopefully a pretty, um, in a pretty low overhead way. So I think one of the, the challenges that the users face when trying to gather useful information about their data is that the tools, things like VTune, um, are really complicated. They require a lot of training. They require sometimes like an Intel architect to be standing over your shoulder looking at you, uh, looking at your, your screen with you. And so what we're trying to do is collect data with low overhead, low pain for the users, but also present it in a way that shows them uh, useful and actionable information about their, their application in a way that they can improve performance and improve, and improve efficiency. And I think the payoff is that when you do this, uh, for the 20 teams that we worked with as part of the NESAP program, you can get um, major speed ups. So the, the program was able to, on average, get 3x speed ups for those applications on K and L. And you can see that those, those uh, improvements that we targeted also made improvements back on the, edits, uh, on the Edison system, but more so on the energy efficient architecture than, than the, the traditional architecture. Uh, so in conclusion, I think you can see that there are a lot, there's a lot to be gained in terms of performance and energy efficiency by connecting users with actionable data on their, on their application. Okay, so this is my last slide, and I think what I want to highlight here is that we, we, I've talked about two activities, one the data collect, one kind of the application readiness program, and I think the future is to kind of couple those two together. Um, and so these are some of the activities that we have going on now at NERS. So we're actively looking to automate the collection of that useful and actionable performance data across the workload as a whole. Um, we're looking at using like, tools like Liquid or PAPI uh, to collect this performance data and present it to users in an automated way. Um, we're beginning to collect even more data, think data from interconnect counter data, like the ARIES counters that I talked about earlier, to understand things like congestion. And we, I think we could begin to think about post-scheduling and topology-aware scheduling of jobs to minimize contention. Um, we're uh, including more data from processor node power counters. So um, this is a pretty, I think this is one of the central themes of this panel, but it's something that's pretty nascent at, at NERSC at this point, which is to explore energy to solution with things like different CPU frequencies using different ISAs, for example. Can you get better energy solution by using AVX2 versus AVX512, for example? Uh, and characterizing workload for potential future co-scheduling, for example. And there's one paper I just wanted to highlight on this topic from a few years ago at NERSC by, by Brian Austin. And I will turn it over. Whoever wants to go. Thanks. They're just, everybody's using the <laughs>
is uh, what do you do at the site level? And then the third aspect is how much improvements can you really get out of all of this instrumentation? And what kind of data becomes relevant to pass around? And how do you pass it around? So I'll be touching on all of those three aspects. Um, to begin with, here's a quick look at how many systems we have at Livermore. This is still missing Sierra and some of the newer systems. So we have um, about 25 to 30 active clusters, both across open and closed zones, various processor architectures, which makes it really complicated to measure and uh, collect information. So with that perspective, um, we, have, we started thinking about how do, how do we develop something that's portable and that can actually give us insights onto the entire site as opposed to a single cluster. Um, before we get there though, I want to start off by showing some tools that we already have for measuring and controlling power. These span across uh, a wide spectrum of tools. So we have a kernel driver called MSR Safe for Intel architectures. We have a user space library called libmsr, which our users can use uh, on Livermore systems as well as other systems that support MSR Safe uh, and uh, you know do power management. Um, I need to point out that MSR Safe is released through our TOS uh, OS framework, which is which means that it's in production and available at trial labs. It can be turned on or off depending on um, depending on the site's requirements. We are working closely with Intel on development of GOPM plugins. GOPM is a job level runtime system, so it's looking at taking a single job under a power cap or an energy cap and trying to optimize its critical path. Conductor is also a similar uh, runtime system, but it's a research goal. GOPM is a production goal. We've been working quite a bit with scheduling and resource management. So we've had uh, dissertations surrounding, uh, several dissertations surrounding scheduling, actually. One of them was Dan Ellsworth, who's in the audience here, um, who wrote PowerSched. The other work comes out of our collaboration with the University of Tokyo, which is Power Aware Slurm. And uh, we also have an in-house scheduler that's been developed right now called Flux. And we have a variation aware, a manufacturing variation aware plugin for that. So uh, the way we are viewing the power problem is more of a software stack that goes from core screen measurements to fine grade optimization. And that's the picture on the, on the right that you see over there. And I wanted to kind of bring that up from the power perspective before I dive into measurement and site level optimization. So that's the set of tools. They're all available on GitHub. So if, you're, uh, if you need to like dig into them and you want to look at what the code looks like, uh, please contact me. Now let's go and start looking at um, what do we need to collect at the HPC site. So at Livermore, we have the problem of having about 30 clusters that we all want to collect data from. And we want to collect broad amounts of data, which is not limited to power and energy. So we are looking at network data, we are looking at facility data, we are looking at rack level, node level, um, you know, application level data. We are looking at annotations of applications, so we are looking at capturing details about application phases, such as computation phases or I.O. phases, and uh, we have uh, developed tools surrounding all of these aspects. Um, the second challenge that we have is, let's assume we collect all of this data. How do we effectively query it? How do we effectively use it and tie it into a runtime system or a scheduler so we can actually go off and do some optimizations based on this data? So that's the improvement part of it. So uh, that figure up there just shows the kind of data that we're trying to collect. So uh, it's, it's a wide range across uh, multiple, multiple clusters. And this is how we're actually doing it. So we have a project that's called SOMA that's ongoing. And this is a dedicated data cluster, which uses uh, Cassandra as the distributed <coughs> part of it. And it uses Spark for the distributed processing part of it. Um, there is a Kafka-based ingestion routine over here, and we are collecting data from multiple sources. We are collecting data from all of the compute clusters using Sandia's LDMS infrastructure. So this lets us get uh, things like network counters, I.O. counters, uh, that kind of data. We have file system data also coming in through LDMS, which is the cluster data. We have InfiniBand switch data coming through OMS interfaces. We have facilities data, which tells us power, humidity, temperature, uh, that kind of stuff coming in through a Pi database, which is another interface. And we have application-specific data coming in through a tool called Caliper. And all of this is being ingested, and this is several terabytes of data sampled every second. Uh, and you can imagine 
the ingestion is a problem, the storage is a problem, the archival is a problem, and, and we're still figuring all of this out. One of the other challenges is security and access, and uh, that's pretty much my next slide. We're also looking into analysis and visualization through dashboards and Jupyter Hub. So we have modified, we have a modified version of that at Rollins Livermore, which we are experimenting with at this point, and uh, looking at how to analyze this data. So in terms of uh, data integration and um, how do we actually solve a certain problem? So one specific example that I want to walk through over here is how do we figure out which job has uh, is placed in a cluster in a form that there is a temperature hotspot? So we are looking at merging data at different granularities here. So for example, you have a job queue output, which gives you the node list or the time range that the job ran for. You have the rack level data, which gives you information about the nodes and the racks. And then you have the actual temperature data as well as the power data. And how do we take this and translate this into a form that we can actually use? And we've developed a tool for that. It's called ScrubJ. It's basically a query engine, which lets us combine different data sources from different granularities. So it figures out how do you extrapolate data between you know, minute granularities to millisecond granularities, which can happen with power as well as other data sets. It also figures out how to, uh, how to map the layout of a job, the physical layout of a job in a cluster onto, um, you know, onto things like temperature hotspots as well as uh, you know, logical layouts and network. So um, ScrubJ is also um, available publicly, so if you need to uh, look at that, I'll be happy to share the links. And now let's look at what we can do with this data and how we can improve things. So two specific things that I want to touch upon are power-aware runtimes and power-aware schedulers. So um, the first example here is coming in from plugins that we have been developing with Intel GOPM. You see four applications over there, and the idea here is to improve time to solution under a power cap as well as an energy cap. So in this particular example, this is showing data on nights landing, y-axis is time to solution, x-axis is different power caps. Um, the, the baseline is a default static allocation. The, um, the second plugin that you see in light blue is the improved advanced plugin that balances power between tasks of an application. And here we've seen um, several benefits of improved performance. Uh, in this specific example, about 30% improvement in time to solution under a power cap, which basically means you improve the energy efficiency as well. And this is my last slide, which talks about scheduling and um, using all of the data that we've measured and trying to put that into the SLURM scheduler. And we've worked with the University of Tokyo on this. Um, we were trying to figure out how to maximize throughput under a power cap, and we've identified um, the fact that having an over-provision system where you have more hardware that you can bring up under a power cap can give you better throughput as well as utilization. Um, there's two IPDPS papers based on this work, so if you're interested in knowing the details, again, um, please contact me. And with that, I'm going to wrap up, and that's pretty much all I have. Thank you, uh, thank you for the invitation to the panel. It's the second time uh, I'm appearing on uh, this panel. So some of you who were there last uh, last year, you may find some reputation. Uh, so my name is Sadaf Alam. I'm from Swiss National Supercomputing Center. And I'm going to talk about how is our view. And I took some feedback from last panel, where we talked about a little bit of in, uh, how we incentivize this type of work. There is a little bit of retrospective, retrospection. So who we are, just in case you don't know, so we are uh, a national facility in Switzerland for researchers. So we operate a, a flagship system called Pistine, a large storage <coughs> facility. You can see our mission in this box. And what we do in addition is we offer some services to uh, some federal entities, such as Swiss Weather Forecasting System called Matrices. 
Um, the only thing I would mention here, because it's an energy-related panel, that we get our cooling from Lake or Lake Lugano. So if you go there, yeah, there is a park called uh, Park Ocean. You can find where our pumping is still ongoing, but you can see that water is being pumped that goes to the data center for like about 1.2 kilometer and cools our systems. So we are pretty much uh, all on uh, renewable energy. Uh, so these were the panel questions, uh, and I will not repeat because Darren said them earlier. But the concepts I would like to introduce here are three. Ones. So we also we are a data center provider. So we all, always consider a user perspective, a user accessing a resource, whether it's a compute resource, whether it's storage, or so there is a user, it's a role. Then we have sysadmin, or we can also in some sense a center way of uh, uh, accessing a matrix or measuring and analyzing data. And the last thing that I have is, uh, is called incentives and, and rewards. Because people may do it because it's the nice thing to do, but usually uh, if, if there are incentives to do some work, and we can argue what those should be, then you would find a little bit uh, uh, it, 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 less uh, difficult to convince people to invest, especially as last time we talked about um, how we can make applications aware of some of the exploiting these features. So, <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, and I showed the system last time also, the Matthews system. And there you can see all these pictures are together the user view, the sysadmin view, which is kind of our view, facility view, and in this case, this was a this is still I think probably the only weather forecasting system that uses GPU, but all entities had an incentive, of course, to run things faster, but being also power efficient because it reduces operational cost. I won't go into detail in how it was done and how we measure performance, but the idea is in this case there is a clear example the work being done on application to take advantage of it energy efficient uh, uh, architecture, but the way that the system and design and, and is being operated, it reduced the overall um, uh, cost of, of our, our overall bill for power. And this is just a, 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 an overview what work was done in application and at also, in this case, at algorithmic level to take it, uh, to of course make application run faster and run on in this case, a GPUs and energy efficient architecture. But in this case, all those incentives and rewards were aligned. What we are doing on our main system, so our this giant system, our main system, you can imagine as a national facility like Blue Waters or NSF or in DOE Insight. So user get their access to the resources, except for few, by writing a, 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 a grant proposal where they ask for more hours. And they get node hours. In their proposal, I don't think there is an entry. Okay, they, they, they are incentivized to use your GPUs, but there is no entry saying that, okay, if you make it more energy efficient, uh, then you will get more hours or something like that. But what we have done is we have made investment to make sure user can get information back about their jobs in terms of usage of resources. So this work builds on uh, uh, some interfaces that trade, which is our vendor provided, which is called DB, and some work we leverage from NVIDIA tools and then integrated into CERN. And what happens is at the end of each job and each run, user gets sort of a report of their job. And it used to be called uh, uh, resource usage report or something. And then I'm, there are quite a few bit of information, but it's just like a script. You can make it right in your home directory anywhere, but you can even query it through Slurm accounting database. But users get this information. Whether they do something with it or not, is, is, is I think right now, it's, uh, you know, from our point of view, it's their business, but the information is there, available to the user level. The previous uh, speaker also mentioned uh, CPU frequency and GPU frequency scaling, so users through Slurm hooks can manage that within the given range. So on this giant system, these features are available. So user 
computers have a lot of control and a lot of information available to them about their job. If, we, if I look at it from a system point of view, so now I have on the top side the system view or side view, we have enabled, and uh, like the previous speaker mentioned, so we have this sidewide uh, monitoring through an ELK, elastic log stash Kibana type of environment where we collect this all system, not data, that's what it that way. But then we created some dashboards. So for example, at the system level or at management level, we have dashboards where we can monitor per row overall uh, uh, power usage. So what you see there is a power usage of one of the rows of this kind. And the data we are collecting on a per job basis, we can do some statistics. So there what I did is like, two days ago just sitting there getting some slurm accounting data and see, okay, which project is using more energy per job or less energy per job. Again, it's meaningless because we right now we don't have any incentive or a reason to find out whether someone is using more or less or what we can do about it. But this information is available and that you can do analysis and, and exploration. At a user level, and this is what I show as a slurm output, user can see which jobs I ran, how much was the energy used, and then they, they can compute power out of it. So this information is available and, and, and can be exploited in, in different ways or correlated. Now going back to the incentive and reward part, and I did mention it last uh, time also, in our community we created this Green 500, and I think it was a very good effort. But sometimes it could be sort of a, a, a it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or something like that. And sometimes you end up in a situation where the reward is just to, I don't know, say just is not probably a right way to say it, to show up with the list. So, and the, one of the main criteria is you have to somehow show up on one of the numbers in the top 500 and then have drive through this energy efficiency. And there was some discussion last time on what level of energy efficiency you can see. So it is a good metric and it gives you some information. And the reason I put it there, not to just you know, bash green 500 as a list or an effort, but to say that if you create the right incentives for people to invest and, uh, and, uh, and improve, they do it. And at the consequence, this is what the discussion I was having with one of my colleagues, and he said, maybe we should not give out node hours, we should all give out like energy credits or something like that <laughs> when we give allocation. Because otherwise, you know, yeah, we are making something and it's good, and you can stay with it if you are budget constrained, but user will not have any incentive. They are already totally overwhelmed with the parallelizing their application, tuning their application, running on different platforms, and they may not be really interested in, in, in doing this type of work. So as, I think as a community, we can also start some high level of discussion there. I don't know, it has been also in some other way. I don't follow energy uh, <laughs> related discussions at the application level that much. But that's okay. And it's not all kind of doom and gloom. I think community is now taking advantage of some of the tools and technologies and the standards uh, that are out there. So what we have noticed by doing this work both at the center level, and if you look across the many data center, the underlying monitoring, logging uh, tools and technologies are similar. And we see in cloud technologies, I just put a picture of a Google Cloud interface. So the idea is, as we, and this, I think this, uh, I picked this RGB slide, I think it was presented last year, a year ago. So what we really need to, if you want to improve data collection and make it in a standard way because on um, green 500 there are level, different level. So there is not this, how do you say, confusion or uncertainty how data was collected on a large scale system. It's automated so that it's collected anyway in a right consistent way. And I showed some standard there. So at a sysadmin level you have sort of similar-ish tool, whether you call uh, low level tool that generate data and sort of similar way of, uh, of interpreting that information that will create a plain level field for most people. And I think it will be good. On the user side, I think we all have made effort. I don't know on other sites how much information, how much of this information is available to users. Our users cannot see right now any of our Grafana dashboard because of various other reasons, but they have all slurred level information available. 
So if we can think of how the cloud, public cloud world is making some of this information available and accessible to their community, maybe, and but it has to be supported by some sort of type of incentives and reward, I think we can make a good process, uh, uh, a lot of progress there. So with that, so um, I'm Satoshi Matsuka, I'm the director of, uh, now I'm the director of Vigan CCS. I'm also a professor of tokenistic technology. You might know me from all the work I've done with like computer like Savame and now ABCI the AI supercomputer business. Uh, but today I'm going to focus my talk on the machine I'm managing now, which is K, and the machine we're building now, which is post-K, in the context of this guy. Um, so I won't talk about Savame or ABC. Okay. So, okay. So, um, firstly about K, which is our current machine. Um, but Don, Lots of operational improvements uh, that we measure, we monitor, just like any other facility. We measure, we monitor, we analyze, we evoke the control plane to try to save power as much as possible. You know, okay, that not is not necessarily a very power efficient machine, but you know, um, but we've done a lot of work to try to optimize the, of course, my operations team. So um, the K is a fairly it's a very big machine. You know, if you've ever seen it, it's like a you know, it's like it, it is a hyperscale data set. And um, uh, and then the power delivery is, and also the cooling facility. It's basically a hyperscale data set. It's got, it's got gas turbines, chillers, air handlers, and you know, the works. So um, there's been a lot of uh, efforts to optimize power. You know, try to get better power contract, for example. Um, and we look at all the pricing of the gas, <coughs> using CGS, the cap for generation plant versus electricity, a lot of uh, uh, optimization of the, elect um, of the co generation plant um, operations, a um, lot of other, you know, lots and lots of measurements and, and the and, uh, result analysis being applied to optimize. The other thing we're doing um, is because uh, you know K is, 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 is you know, it's a very big machine. We can go up to like, like 20 megawatts um, in terms of uh, power usage. But on uh, a normal daily job scheduling, when you got hundreds of jobs running your system, it's like the right hand side, where things are fairly uh, like the cloud is very much um, the job. The power consumption is fairly stable because you get this randomization. Effect. However, when you try, when you run big jobs, you know there are days when you run yeah, like two day, a couple of days a month, you let people uh, run the job for the entire machine, and then this huge spike occurs when the job starts up and the job, uh, the job is um, the job finishes, everything is kind of goes up, goes back to idle state. Uh, for the K, it's more than four megawatts, and it's fairly instantaneous. So you see this huge spikes. Uh, so what we do. virtual laser pointer. So uh, what we do is um, we look at the uh, submission queue, we look at the job's history of how much power it used, and then we do sort of a uh, long duration with pre preparation to turn up the, you know, the chillers and the power facilities so that it's ready for this uh, huge spike. So this is done automatically, and um, so uh, we do this kind of core. So K has done a whole lot of kinds of core screen optimizations to reduce power, save power as we use energy in the overall, overall cost of ownership. So uh, the good and bad is good is with you know, overall over the past seven years of operation basically achieved about 40 percent reduction in electricity costs. And this is a baseline kind of thing you do before you do any kind of fancy stuff with you know, job level job where power scheduling all that stuff. You gotta do the basics. So we achieve forty percent reduction by doing all these things. Ah, however, you know, basically we reach the limit. We've done everything we can. But 
okay, is not a very good machine to be monitoring. In fact, that's what we have any monitoring facilities that modern processors have. We can only measure power, for example, at the back end. <coughs> so we can't, since we can't measure, and this is the theme of this panel, since we can't measure, we can't control at that granularity. And, you know, we've done, of course, there, we've done some studies. There's, a, you know, for example, there are studies to correlate like, processor counters to good deaths and correlation processor counters. Some processor counters have strong correlation to the actual power use of processors, so we try to use those metrics and so forth. But then the other bad thing is you know, we don't have a control plane to control, for example, each processor's voltage or frequency. So we can't, so there's very limited control we can do. So for the post gag, um, of course we realize that. And for the post gag, uh, saving power, you know, given very uh, fine grain monitoring uh, capabilities, and also giving very fine grain control, was a mandate for it, uh, when we designed the chip. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the post gag machine uh, will be, you know, be come up, will be installed sometime. Start, uh, we already have a chip now. If you're interested, you can go to the Fujitsu booth, see the actual chip. Um, it's, uh, it'll achieve about 100 times speed up for some applications uh, compared to K. Um, 100, and this is real fast. Some we go about 170 times, 150 times or something. Uh, that's because you know, we achieved some real innovations in chip design. It's ARM processor, so it boots Linux. It probably won Windows if you certify it to make Microsoft. Um, so the wrong word. Um, hopefully I can have it on my desktop. I can, that's 48 cores, I can have 48 word instances and just run at full speed. Um, um, but it's very low power, um, uh, tremendous memory bandwidth, and this has all the all has also has the modern AI capabilities like uh, video plug. So in fact, um, so it's like a mini core CPU, it has 48 cores. So but it has also, it's very much like a GPU. It's not to say it has a GPU, separate GPU inside. It has, it's a little CPU, it's only with vector extensions. But um, uh, with some of the benchmarks, um, uh, we have seen uh, some, not for the real application benchmarks, because it has massive memory bandwidth, it has about nearly one terabyte of memory bandwidth, because it's the first CPU to use HPM2. Um, it's at about eight times the memory bandwidth Skylink Xeon, and thus we get about some on size like CFD code. The majority of codes we get came from like back to three and back to five speed up over uh, Skylink. And this is true. Um, um, in fact, if you do like the flops a watt um, measurements, which is not the best measurement because, of course, that impact is pretty much useless as a HPC benchmark, as we all know that. But just to make sure that we excel on that, um, but, um, like the video. So Intel Night Landing, Skylake, their Gable Flop, Gable Flop a lot is, which they're good at, supposed to be good at, is still below 5. Uh, media uh, V100, the Volta, is about 15 on the top machine, the, the media machine. And the A64FX uh, for the whole system is supposed to also exceed this number. And of course, we were measured some of these numbers, and so this would be a very power efficient chip despite the fact it's several times faster than it's Okay, and run all the standard arm code. Okay, so again, it's, it was important, it was very important to get the basics right. You know, if you design a power inefficient chip, but try to make it efficient, there's no point, you know, because it'll be power efficient, but inefficient nonetheless. So the trick is, so the, as, a first, as a first principle, Get the data center operation right, which we have done. We we did and for the next for this machine, which will come up very soon, we design a chip which is super power efficient while being super fast, which is again the principle we want to follow. But then and the final piece of course is to again the theme of this panel, measure and it's sort of control. <coughs> and that's where the difficulty comes in. So just to give you um, the, the good words. Uh, this chip has very, very <coughs> fine grain measurement and power control capabilities. So uh, the, there are two levels of energy monitoring. There's an energy monitor per chip, and, uh, and uh, it basically follows the power API as defined by this group. And 
and uh, so you know, following standards. And the third, there is a energy medium finer grain <coughs> analyzer for core, and, and this is this we monitor uh, by pat by the by, uh, by the pat database. And power API is about millisecond level about millisecond resolution, and uh, the core level uh, power energy measurement can be a nanosecond resolution. So we have all the you know, measurements in place, which is you know so we can measure it <coughs> as opposed to close scale. Uh, the the K the K chip. And then uh, we can control too. So aside from the frequency and voltage uh, that a lot of the standard processors offer, we also have extra functions to turn off parts of the chip as necessary, depending on the characteristics of their uh, computation. For example, when you have bandwidth bound computation, it's pointless to power on all the LUs. So we can clock a, uh, uh, we can clock a the execution units so we have less of them. And then, you know, just let this reduce AOUs run while we turn up the, uh, the power on the memory to the full extent to get maximum bandwidth. For compute bound, we can do the inverse. So um, the load power for the 48 cores for GGEM is about 160 watts or so. Um, pretty, pretty power efficient since we'll be hitting like almost three teraflops with that. Uh, the stream triad is we get about 840 gigabytes per second, which is, you know, pretty, which is about the same as Volta. There, um, however, if we don't do the power control, we use up uh, 190 watts, which is so, you know, with this chip, the, the stream is actually uses more power. That's because HPM uses a lot of power. However, if we uh, do the power control and optimize, for example, um, turn, up, turn off some of the uh, execution units, like the you know, like the figure you see here, then the power goes down to 160. We got the same uh, to be at the same level as the running DJ. So the chip has these features to do very intricate power control and also, of course, the power measurement. Okay, so all is good. Okay, so we can measure, we can control. Okay, and however, then I'll give you the bad news. Because, well, the, the machine will be packaged in a very dense package. It will have 380 GHz nodes per rack, which is about a pound block and double precision, if you worry about that. But, you know, it's very dense. Again, you can see this in Fujitsu loop. But then we'll have hundreds, what we'll have is hundreds of these racks for the entire post K configuration. I can't tell you the exact number. It's more than 100,000 nodes. Below 200,000 bus, way above 100,000. More than hundreds of petabytes, uh, petaflops. If you go to reduce precision, it's exaflop. It, more than exaflop. More than 100 petabytes per second memory bandwidth. And approaching 10 million cores. And of course, you know, uh, the, the rack level FPGA to cap the power total to 1300 megawatts. Okay? So if you compare it, but if you compare K to post K, the peak power can be if you know, turn up all the knobs, you know, like highest freight frequency, don't turn up any don't turn up any of the units, the entire machine can use more, more than 40 megawatts. I mean there are hardware, like I said, at PGA until instantly lock it down so it will be below the 37, 37, 37 megawatt cap. The power fluctuation can be up to 20 megawatts. Which is, you know, which would affect the local grid. And moreover, we have 10 million cores for more than 100,000. <coughs> so even at the power API level, if the each instrumentation is a few kilobytes per second, the data stream will be several gigabytes per second, which means we'll get 100 terabytes per hour uh, or multi petabytes per day. And if we go to the core level, there's just no way we can handle that. Just no way. So what should we do? Should we sample? Should we have high stream data processing? What's what kind of, what, 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 what's the technology? A lot of the technologies we know can scale to this level of the instrumentation. So and thus we cannot. You know, so the control right now we're in rudimentary. The last slide. Well, but we know that if we can control, we'll get tremendous benefits. 
the work done by Masaki Kondo, uh, sitting over there, by the way, you see his photo, uh, um, my new, uh, one of my new team leaders. Um, so uh, this is a lot of work, uh, jumping with Livermore on power over provision system like post K versus how to exert power control. So this work basically says, well, for, under certain conditions, if you properly cap power in a very fine grained fashion, you can get tremendous improvements in throughput. For example, you can get, uh, here's one of them. Under certain conditions, you can get 74 for 1.74 time throughput improvement, or like 83.7% turnout time reduction by doing this very really fine grained power capping. Not hard power capping, but very fine grained, very orchestrated power capping depending on job characteristics. So we know there's going to be benefits. You know, when you have a facility that's already using 37 megawatts, it better be efficient. Um, so the work ahead of us is to basically see how we can apply research like this under this massive scale. Right now, none of the tools we have can scale this. So, but we'll hopefully try to uh, achieve this, you know, and then we'll hopefully share knowledge with uh, the other facilities to somehow tackle these kinds of problems. Thank you. All right. We're, uh, that's the set of presentations. Uh, we're now in a Q&A, so I'd invite those who have questions to come up to the microphone. And while you're thinking about that, let me pose a question to the panel. Um, so, yes, wake up. <laughs> uh, so Satoshi just sort of talked about the balance of complexity and, and cost in some sense of getting data versus the value. What do you think that balance point is? Well, yeah, all of you. Well, since I raised the question, maybe. <laughs> um, yes. Oh, yeah. Obviously, it has to be on the plus side. Um, like the, the president, like, uh, for example, the work by, by Kondo san. If that's applicable and we achieve even a modest gain in throughput, um, or turnaround time, whereas the penalty for achieving that is, uh, is way below the, um, the benefits, then of course is obviously is something that should be done. So it's all about the benefit, uh, measuring benefits versus the cost. So um, I have a comment on that. So I think we're looking very closely at the content of this group on some of this. Uh, as well as uh, runtime system development. So, um, Can you lean a little closer to them? Speak up a little bit. Yes, okay. So one of the things that um, we're... Closer. Okay, <laughs> is this better? <laughs> yes. Um, all right, so one of the things that we've been struggling with, and this is an uh, open question to the community as well, is there are some applications that benefit a lot from our management, and there are some applications that don't. So being able to be um, to being able to classify the workload that you're running on your system becomes very important, especially from the point of view of uh, discussing things like over provision systems or uh, having power aware schedulers or power aware runtimes. Because the cost benefit analysis is going to come down to how frequently do I sample a given application. For example, if you have lin pack, you don't need to sample it as often. But if you have if you have an application that's uh, say doing molecular dynamics, that needs to be sampled more frequently because it has smaller uh, application phases. So that trade-off space is uh, is something that's still an open question to us. Any, any other thoughts from the panel? Yeah. 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 I don't want to start. <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to okay. contaminate <laughs> So I would say, uh, so coming from an operation uh, point of view, I would say complexity is in the eye of the beholder. So if I ask my sysadmin to do anything different what they used to do, it's complex. Right. <laughs> Until the, so I think it's it's uh, it, it, it's um, 
as, as others say, we need, we need to be able to articulate in a, in a rather quantitative manner what, what, is our, what, what the goal we would like to accomplish. Because as other, uh, uh, all of us suggested, we now have a lot of data which we can gather, collect, monitor online. It's about throwing resources on our ELK cluster or something similar. And, 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 and we can make that choices at a system or operational level, or in some cases at a research level. But in a truly operational environment, we have to consider overheads. Like in SLAM, we can collect a lot more, but we don't, because it will slow down the rate at which people can submit jobs. So I, 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 I think it would depend on a, uh, on a, on we as a community of working with our user or user community, <clears throat> what is the common goal? Uh, yeah. I think I think I would just echo I think what a lot of people have said, but I think one of the things that we need to do if we want to get the kind of user community and the and the application community uh, involved in this process is to is to really articulate the value to them and provide them. I think measuring and providing them information is helpful. So I think. You know, and nurse people can see the power that their job is consuming via slurm, but most of them probably say, you know, shrug their shoulders and say, cool. <laughs> but what we need to do is sort of present that data or frame that data in a way that's actionable to them and where they can clearly kind of see those benefits. That was kind of where I was going to go with the question here. So, uh, so we'll kick it back to the panel here, which is that uh, last year we arrived on, if you can't measure it, you can't approve it, and so there was a lot about the ability to instrument and the ability to organize the data that you've instrumented, so there's a lot of infrastructure developed for that. Uh, things like the ScrubJ, where you can uh, more efficiently pose queries against that data, but that's just posing the query. Um, uh, I think the theme that I heard multiple speakers say here is that until you can represent the data in a way that is actionable, uh, but not just actionable, it has to be like roof line where you know that there's room for improvement. Yes, my job consumed X amount of power. Uh, is there any room for improvement? There's no point in trying if I don't know what the gap is. So what do you guys think is uh, the kind of technologies or infrastructure that can take it to the next level, uh, or can you take it to the next level? Is it just require uh, a bunch of smart people scratching their heads staring at 200 terabytes of collective <laughs> instrumentation? <laughs> I'm pretty sure the answer to that is no. <laughs> Wait. Well, I mean, just to kind of... Uh, follow along that, that theme. I do think something like roofline for power efficiency would be would be great. So we have roofline that sort of sets the ceiling for performance, uh, but having roofline that sets the ceiling for power efficiency would be something that, that really provides an actionable like and that might be a useful avenue of research in the next the next year. No, so she said we should disagree. So I'll <laughs> <laughs> it's a panel. So I mean, so from a disagreement point, I mean, I said it in my talk also in some way. I mean, we and coming, although I'm not an application person, but if, I mean, we are throwing them a, a, like heterogeneity at different level from a programming complexity and all the things you have to think about in terms of tuning and optimizing and running and scale. And we, if you add one yet another dimension, and like you said, and then you throw yet more data at it. And so, <clears throat> so I, I think for us as a community, we also need to uh, understand from a user point of view. Um, there, I mean, roofline model for, I mean, if, if maybe you take a, like a performance energy point of view is one thing, but what, what are their science priorities against which they should care and worry about? And if you want to be very dictatorial about it from a from a like a funding agency point of view, everyone must save power. <coughs> then you should allocate resources differently. So this is what I say. I think that everyone has a lot to do on their plate, and we say now oh, on top of everything, you have to look at something else to tune and optimize. I don't think we will go that far. But I don't disagree in the fundamental research we have to do to get there. Um, well, you have a good point there, John. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, 
I'm not going to deliberately disagree. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what's, but um, I think what I hinted was, okay, so there is also the factor of a return on investment. Like, so uh, we can instrument to help at finance resolutions, and we can model, you know, like for example, um, uh, you know, there, are, there can be a lot finer models with respect to application power performance, you know, given all the parameters, and, uh, uh, performance counters, and so forth, um, or, you know, or it can be like extended roofline model, like this would exceed the depth of power, including power. Um, so there are um, instrumentations of various resolutions, models of various resolutions, and of course the power knobs that we can tune in so forth at various resolution at various, you know, both time and and also uh, hardware resolutions. Um, the question is, I mean, how much of this do we need? I mean, at which point do we get enough return on investment? This is, kind of goes back to the earlier question with Dan, where you know, I mean, we can instrument and do everything to every little detail, but there is so much overhead, and return on investment would get so low, it's not worth it, and we can just prolong the application one time and, and so forth. And a lot of the power studies that I've seen don't really go into this discussion. They just say, well, do this measurement, and oh, we get like 5% you know, improvement on, on top. And that's usually the pattern of these papers. They don't really go into this more holistic view of how fine do we have to go to? What's the model? Uh, how fine a model or how coarse grain a model can we have in order to get the best of the bank in the buck? And so that's something the avenue we, we may exploit now that we have all, to, all this data. And now we have like you know, the post the basic 4FX chip that we can exert power, uh, <coughs> fine rate measurements and control. But how much of this can, do we need is something that is kind of an open question, research question. Okay, so um, I completely agree with that. I think we really need to figure out how frequently we need to measure things and for what workloads we need to measure things at what frequency. So some workloads, some queues, some applications don't require as frequent measurement. It doesn't have to be as fine grade as uh, people have been advocating for. So, so let me ask the question a little more bluntly and then we'll go to the audience. Who cares more, system operators or application developers? No, the director who has to. <laughs> yeah. That's what I meant by system and, operators. And, 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 you know, and yeah. the Matthews' example was because they built the phone. Right. Yeah. So, and then they own the application. So in that case, yeah, so it's, it's probably to agree with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and then, yeah. So that's where it gets to that social versus financial. Yeah. So um, one thing that we, we've been able to observe over time is that there is literally an actual cost of moving data um, a particular length um, within the computer. Um, and, and so there, it seems to me that there would be a pretty good way to build a relationship um, between the, um, the power used and actually the performance of of an application because if you're like you're using cache, you're not moving data as far, you're not moving data as much, things like that. Um, but as far as I can tell, people haven't really talked about that. You alluded to the fact that um, uh, there are some applications that um, really are um, um, improved by power capping and others that aren't. And I was wondering if there's uh, any other anecdotes or um, stories that can be told about or relationships that have been extrapolated that can um, build the relationship between performance and power? Um, yes, so I come in from a research perspective, so I'm pretty much the only non-production person on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, from the research point of view, people have been exploring the challenge of uh, power balancing versus data movement quite a bit. In fact, we have been looking into when should we migrate data versus when should we just redirect power, and that problem is still unsolved. So, to answer your question, uh, yes, it's going on in the research community, but I haven't seen anything of that sort in production or any piece of software that actually lets you do that as a tool. 
So you're really, just to make sure I understand the question, you're asking about effectively data locality for energy data. Right. I, um, I, would, I guess what I'm wondering is if you are optimizing an application for power, um, does that also lead to better performance um, because you're not uh, because by doing that you're starting to not move data as much and and I was curious if if there were more if there were examples like that so that you could use the argument to developers that if you optimize for power uh, I mean you you're probably going to get more performance too well. Um I think you got the power and energy confused. Yeah. That, okay, yeah. That, yeah. Because usually what the, the, the usual wisdom, especially in these days when, and there are a lot of, actually there are a lot of research on this. Um, I don't know if you've said this. Um, uh, the, um, when you optimize for energy, um, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the typical scenario is you run to completion as fast as possible. So your duration, your time duration is minimal. And then by your power it goes up, it shoots up because you're running as fast as you know, as fast as possible, either you're maximizing LU or you're reading memory. Uh, but you get the lowest energy profile because the uh, in modern system there's a baseline, there's baseline power, no matter what you use. And you know, uh, like lead currents or you know, some underlying you know, network, you know, have a, have a baseline. The, the photonics you have that was not a laser turn on all the time. So uh, this will uh, minimize energy, but you get maximum power. Um, and, and there are variations of this. So um, from, from OPEC standpoint, what you want to do is to minimize energy because, that, you know, because that's, the, that's the cost. Mm -hmm. But from the facility standpoint, you want to co control the power because that's a capex cost. And there's, you know, there's been long discussions with regards to whether you minimize CAPEX, OPEX, and, and you know, what's the up? It's all about the uh, what you target as your optimization function, and uh, and and there are optimizers that lets you do this when you uh, it's because it's a it, it's a question of a linear uh, of, a, of a optimization question. But the large system that gets so especially with the manual power gets so big, so you know can't really optimize. Um, it's hard to optimize to the optimum. So they use heuristics, but then to use heuristics, you have to get lots of sample points, and, and then this whole business discussion, the panel discussion. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this was a really exciting conversation, and it seems like there's a lot of potential. So my question is, how close to optimum are we in the level of funding and research going into this? Um, you know, I don't know, is this like just a sideline that you kind of bury with all your other work, or? Or is this a, 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 a true research uh, endeavor, and, and are we at the optimum level of funding? And then the sequel, or the second question is, what's the flow down opportunities uh, outside of HPC? I mean, when we learn these optimization strategies, will that will there will those be able to be applied in uh, in other uh, in other data centers? Can you ask that one more time? I mean, I, I can't comment on the. Research funding, but as we sort of alluded many times, there are open research questions for um, uh, later. So I think if we, I mean, I, I tend to compare, I mean, I tend to sort of bundle up, which is not necessarily the right thing. The data center, HPC data center, is one category, and there's hyperscale centers, cloud type, and another. And there have been studies there, and I think we can learn from them. But there are some fundamental differences we have to kind of always keep in mind uh, in terms of resource management, schedule, utilization, as well as system design. So there is some kind of, uh, how would I say, cross-fertilization that's happening, and this is coming from low-level instrumentation. Um, and and, uh, and from a scheduling and resource, uh, I mean, there were, I think, I don't know, remember Google DeepMind and other things when they came about, uh, uh, but uh, we, we can definitely leverage it. Uh, in terms of active research related to an operational site and facility, I don't. I, mean, I think from our point of, from a Swiss National Center point of view, uh, there, are, there is fundamental research going on in at university level, but at the operational level, it's primarily 
code acceleration, and if you can get some benefit, you get it, but it's mostly mostly capex. Well, um, from, you know, from the perspective of someone who's paying the bill, um, so for example, even if you restrict it to just my center, right, we're spending more than $20 million on electricity every year, more than $20 million. So if I say 10%, that's $2 million. And, and you know, $2 million for research is a lot of money, but we're not meeting. So you know, I'd like to feedback that you know, fund some research that two million bucks a year, and then be able to get ten percent. You know, that's a you know, that's a that's a huge winning situation. So, um, and of course, this will proliferate throughout the industry if applied properly. So, I think um, uh, going, so. Getting back to the question, yes, we you know, I think we're not funding it sufficiently enough and getting the result and, and yielding the fruits of the research because it's a huge you know, saving energy is a huge endeavor. Look at automotive companies today. Put a huge amount of research into getting efficient, you know, efficient uh, combustion engines and motors and so forth. So, and you know, five and uh, the amount of power that's being used by the whole uh, uh, IDC in the world is like is now approaching five percent of the entire electricity usage. So of course, um, these research leads to tremendous savings. Having and the second reason this should be a research proper research is you know. It should be research that's reproducible and available to the uh, entire industry. Like, you know, so you mentioned DeepMind. Like, you know, um, so DeepMind announced, okay, so they, they applied their uh, DeepQ, which is a reinforcement learning algorithm. And when they applied, Google announced when they applied it to the data center, they get 40% savings on their, on their PUE. Okay, well, that's great, 40%. Okay, but we don't really quite know how they did it. But it's reinforcement learning, but we yeah, haven't opened up the code. Moreover, there, you know, if you read their press statement a few years ago, so a few years ago, they said, "Oh no, we have a very efficient, uh, we have a tremendously efficient data center, and our PUE is like one point, below 1.1." 1 .1. Okay, so if the PUE is 1.1, if you say, uh, but you don't really know the definition of 40 percent because if you're, if, the, if you're saving like. 40% of the total electricity, how can your PUE be 1.1 1 .1 in the first place? Or, if they're saving from 1.1 to get 40%, that's 1.1 1 .1 to 1.06, and that's not a lot of savings. Well, incredible saving, not, not a lot of savings. I'll so just put on my former Microsoft hat for a moment and say, you know, the, the, this touches on the reward structure, because in a research perspective, <coughs> reward is research discovery so this subject to some financial and political realities about the level of funding that can go into machines. In private data centers, the reward metric is profit. And so that may or may not drive you to reduce operating costs. Uh, that's a piece of your PL, but it's not it, the real goal is profit. And there's some social and political constraints on those too, but it, they are different. So just keep those things in mind. Okay, go ahead. But yes, yes, of course. Um, but the point, point here being that um, it's, we don't really know the true story because of all these uh, other issues involved. So, uh, so research, open research, is important um, in order to drive the entire industry, not privatize to certain sectors with uh, different types of, of uh, metrics. And um, so, uh, funding open research in this area is critically important. But I think we're funding it um, compared to the benefits. Do you have comments before I turn it over to Natalie? Um, just a quick comment on the DOE perspective. So under the Exascale Computing Project, we have one small project that's doing power research and power development, which is where the GOPM as well as this learning work is coming from. And yes, uh, it would be nice to have more funding in that area. <laughs> Natalie? Okay, so um, NERSC has a, an amazing data collection system that extends from building automation systems, you know, uh, to the CPU. So, um, it's a highly integrated data measurement collection system. Um, CSCS has very good data collection, but it's not highly integrated. So. You've got it at your system and you've got it in your facility, 
but you're not making a huge effort to integrate tightly, couple the two. I know oh, Livermore is, that is a goal for Livermore, ultimately to tightly couple the two capabilities. And Satoshi, I know that's your, your goal as well. So um, it's interesting, um, you know, I'm curious why CSCS is, is not pursuing that. And I'm also curious, Jack, um, you know, do you see this as a real value add? Um, you know, how, how has it helped you, in, you know, with your particular job um, so far? And, and how do you see it helping you in the future, if at all? So I, I actually think that this is key, the coupling and, and having your data together so that you can kind of correlate it and ask more, more interesting questions than you can when the data is sort of separated or, or siloed. Um, and in particular, I think, as I, as I said sort of in my presentation, I think the future is really coupling the application performance data and counters and power uh, uh, at the, the kind of core and CPU and node levels with the broader impact uh, that, that that's having a, on the kind of facility-wide measurements. Um, and I think, you know, we have this vision that users will be able to run their job, and I think like we saw in some of the other presentations, after it's complete, the, they'll be able to see kind of a profile of what was happening at the facility when their job was running, what was their impact in that picture, and um, ideally, how can they go about making improvements to, to, the, to their application. I think it's only when you really couple all that data together that you can begin to, to put, a, put a story together. So there's, there's a number of things we can do at a facility level in, in, in terms of smart scheduling and um, minimizing sort of variability in, in, the, in the job performance. But if we want to really get the software developers involved, I think you have to provide them information that kind of points them and uh, in the direction of the changes that they have to make. And so um, this is why sort of earlier I wasn't sort of advocating necessarily that we need to collect even more and more and more data. We just need to present it in a smarter way. So, yeah, I think when we say users, I think there will be, a, at this time in the day, I mean, I will answer Natalie's question because she asked me this and I, I personally think there aren't that many users who really, they use their applications as black boxes. So we have to really know which users we are talking about. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, it's, then the return on investment topic comes in. And I, I don't think we are trying not to integrate it, but we do not have a, I would call it, an incentive or a reason to, to maybe a pain point from an energy uh, a point of view is not as high as probably <laughs> yours. <laughs> so maybe when it start hurting that much, we may start caring about it a little bit more. No, but the, the bottom line is, uh, yeah, of course, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense. If you think about this, I would like to know when my application ran a bit slow. But most people, I think, few percent point, we don't, they don't care. Because then the way we build and run HPC system, we run them in a shared mode. So no one gets totally reproducible performance anyway because of you are sharing network, storage, and all these things. So just imagine you throw one another shared parameter and why do you care? I mean, what can you, how can you make sense out of it? So, I mean, if someone tells me I, my application ran 5% slower on this died, I say, okay, I mean, yeah, life is tough. Uh, because uh, <laughs> because I'm not going to go and investigate, okay, which partition of the system and what was the network load and con congestion on the other side. Of course, it is. So you need something. So I, I think uh, I'm, what I'm arguing is you have to be pragmatic about these things because just throwing more and more data at people uh, and and having these fine grained measurement without having this basic research behind it. To, to support it, may lead us to just additional investment because I don't want to be in a situation where, where, where my research and monitoring infrastructure is consuming more energy than it's saving to monitor and record it, like the PUE goes 
Two short comments. One, of course, is you know, uh, a person's behavior is done a lot on the reward structure. So, so when we buy cars and drive, we worry about fuel efficiency. We try to, you know, unless you're one you know, of those fast stops, you try to drive very conservatively to uh, be fuel efficient. But when you ride buses or trains, you don't really worry. There's no concern. So, uh, so it's your super, and your share supercomputer is more like a bus or train rather than your personal machine. So, but, but are there social reward structure that we can impose for people who do worry about how buses and trains are become fuel efficient? So that's something interesting. The second is, um, so you know, on a real large production machine, it's really hard to do these kinds of experiments. Um, I, I mentioned, you know, work earlier I mentioned, you know, we should be able to come up with some sort of a force screen uh, Terms of granularity of uh, monitoring control and so forth, but, but again, it's very difficult to do these in a production environment. So what we're investigating is uh, rather, you know, there are, uh, in engineering. You always be, you know, you always, there are other disciplines that always build models um, using these uh, simulation toolkits to uh, model the behavior of a system. And uh, what we start to experiment is to build models, uh, uh, simulated, simulated models of, of the system in order to come up with the, the strategies to uh, save power and not really rely on the presence of physical systems in the experiments. Thank you very much, sir. I'm Rasmus Tamster from Disney Animation. So I really like the, the title of this panel, so I couldn't help uh, but Google. Uh, and it turns out that Slight modification of uh, management uh, mantra. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. But it was also interesting to see that the first uh, couple of uh, articles that Google actually pointed me to were all saying, well, this is a horrible idea. Because <laughs> not everything that's important to manage can actually be measured. So I guess my, my question to the panel here is are we missing the bigger picture? Are there things that can be measured that are actually more important? So are there things that can't be measured that are more important? So maybe I'll, I'll ask the question in a slightly different way. If you got more science results, would you be willing to use more energy? Sure. Yeah, so I, I, I I think that maybe echo some of what was said down on the panel before is that, I mean, I think what scientists do ultimately care about is sort of the time to science rather than energy to solution or time to solution necessarily. Um, and then, you know, at a facility, you know, scientists get a certain allocation, they give it to their grad students, and their grad students, like, blow it on incorrect input in their calculations <laughs> or something like that, right? Uh, so there, there are all of these immeasurable, sort of immeasurable quantities that like, maybe we'd be better off just improving the training that we give new grad students when they get, get an account. Um, so I, th I think that there is maybe some validity to that sort of argument, but um, I think uh, no, I, I think that there's clearly um, value in improving the things that you can measure performance count for scientific impact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I said, you know, when people, uh, you know, when there are direct, um, when there are direct merits, then people can optimize to that. So, um, so I'm like, just like my car example, you know, uh, you drive fuel efficient, but you don't really care uh, to expand it a little bit. Okay, say so you have a bullet train and a normal train. A bullet train goes like three times faster, it uses more energy. But people, a lot of people use ride bullet trains anyhow, and they're more expensive. But you know, but they have their daily business they conduct, which it mandates they go on these very fast trains. Uh, not in the US, but in Europe and Japan, those places in China we have those. <laughs> so um, yeah, but uh, but why they is immeasurable from the standpoint of the operator. Of course, they can sample, they take census, and so forth. 
uh, though they try to build economic models to make it to justify their operating expenses versus income. Yeah, but these are you know, somewhat hard numbers to measure. So yes, there are. So that really correlates to scientific health. And why do people, why do scientists do this? And they are always approximated whether uh, I don't think it's not <coughs> measurable, but it's always, it is always approximated. <coughs> So to answer Dan's question, um, if you could accomplish more science, you would be to respect more people. Um, I think you can accomplish more science and save energy and be more power efficient. That's pretty much what the research community has been working towards. We have um, several results coming out of Japan, Europe, as well as the US, precisely showing the fact that you can accomplish more science, improve scientific throughput, try to save energy and time to save power. So I think uh, the answer to that is the moment you start building efficient systems, you automatically improve the amount of science. So that's one of the I mean, I mean, so all the science doesn't begin and end in the simulation part, which tend to run on HPC system. And uh, if if we are somewhat Maybe majority of it, I mean, we have to look from a work control because you could have a situation where you're using transferring, I don't know, terabytes or more from an experimental facility or something else, and people, people are using maybe their own system, public cloud, or whatever. So, yeah, if, yeah, if you, if, I will not say that you should, what else can you measure? Then you have to have, not only you have this idea of scientific impact or time to science. But what your experiment, uh, this virtual experiment or lab looks like, then we get a bigger picture. I mean, right now, when we talk, at least the perspective I had and I brought was more from a simulation point of view. But there are other aspects, and then we can have a holistic view. That's what I would ideally like to see. Right. So one last thing, um, you know, just to add on to my previous comment, I do think correctness and reproducibility in science is very important. So you need to spend more energy to ensure that your simulation and your science is actually correct and deterministic or non-deterministic applications um, have different uh, ways of being implemented and run in supercomputers. I think expending more energy for that would be necessary. All right, it's also you get the last question. It's nice to have all these ability to control things and, and uh, present that to users, but uh, in my view, users don't really pay the power bill. Right? Uh, I believe on our NVR facilities, users are charged by load hours, and, and that's what they, they can see, they can count, and they can uh, uh, measure for each job they run. So do you uh, plan or envision charging users somehow uh, according to the energy that they, uh, their applications are spending or, or how much their jobs are, are spending? Maybe let me generalize that question because energy has a cost. If people have asked questions about rather than allocating no dollars, do you allocate uh, euros or yen or dollars to people for computing? Because there is a real cost to the machine. To some extent, I think we are doing that. Like, if you take a look at clouds, right? Um, the, or even in some supercomputer cells, you, you may have um, the, the cues or whatever, you know, uh, the nodes and what the are priced differently according to how capable they are. Now, obviously, the capable ones are using more energy. So, you're not directly going to money energy, but uh, you know, it's occurred both CapEx and OPEX costs combined. That's the least system of price structure. And again, I'm alluding to my training samples. Trains are also doing that. The fast rates are more expensive, the slow trains are cheaper. So um, it's all about the, there's some more economics as to um, how much they can charge versus how much the, uh, uh, the cost. And um, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's normal. It's normal economy. It's the standard economy. Economic discipline. And um, I don't, so if we're not charging people um, the cost that we are not following economic principles. 
the other thoughts? What else would be a question for any center? If like for the any four hours that has been granted, you are associated with the amount of dollar. For example, we do it even for small development, <coughs> and we get many users. They got scared. Are we going to pay that? And we said that's not not yet. <laughs> but <laughs> any other center that associate with the four hour granted not hours with the amount of dollar, that probably some people will realize that. As you said, that's our operation. Mm -hmm. so that is very important. All right, well, on that note, let's thank our panel and thank you.